and welcome to ADCES's podcast, The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. In each episode, we speak with guests across the diabetes care space to bring you perspectives, issues, and updates that elevate your role, inform your practice, and ignite your passion. I'm your host, Jody Lavin Tompkins, a board-certified nurse in advanced diabetes management and the Director of Accreditation and Content Development at the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. Our guest today is Christy Schumacher. Christy is a Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Director of the PGY2 Ambulatory Care Residency Program at Midwestern University College of Pharmacy at the Downers Grove Campus and a clinical pharmacist at Advocate Medical Group Southeast Center in Chicago, Illinois. She currently works in a primary care clinic to provide comprehensive medication management for a variety of internal medicine disease states, including but not limited to heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, COPD, and asthma. Christy is here with us today to talk about the GLP-1 and GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonists which are among a class of anti-hyperglycemic medications that has been available in the U.S. for 17 years. Support for this episode has been provided by Lily. Christy, welcome to the huddle. Thanks for having me, Jody. Happy to be here to discuss GLP-1 and GIP-GLP receptor agonists today. So I'm wondering if you can give our audience an overview of these agents and discuss what is currently available. Of course. So these agents have been on the market a while now. However, with the new cardiovascular outcomes trials and different data that we've collected through clinical trials, we found a variety of different benefits of using these agents in people with diabetes. So now they're actually indicated in people with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or ASCVD or those with indicators of high risk, those with chronic kidney disease or heart failure after SGLT2 inhibitors, and in those that need further glycemic management as they've been proven to be very efficacious in having persons with diabetes achieve their glycemic management as well as weight management goals. So overall, they've really been quite efficacious, very helpful in helping us manage people with diabetes. And we've actually found that now we can use it less insulin and have better outcomes by incorporating these agents into our clinical practice. So out of the GLP-1 and GIP-GLP-1 receptor agents that are available, We have different options. We've got injectables versus orals, and then we have daily and weekly agents. So we have exenatide, which is used twice daily, zero to 60 minutes before breakfast and dinner. We have loreglutide, lixazinatide, and then oral semaglutide, which are all once daily. And then we have semaglutide, dileglutide, exenatide ER, as well as terzepatide, which are all once weekly. There's a variety of agents, and it depends really what the person with diabetes is looking for. Is it easier for them to remember to take a medication once a day? They have a pill formulation now with oral semaglutide if a person's hesitant about injectables. And then for those that are looking for just once weekly, we have four options as well now that are for once weekly dosing. There's also indications for cardiovascular risk reduction with dileglutide, semaglutide, and loreglutide. And those were found by looking at the cardiovascular outcomes trials. All three of those agents assessed the three-point MACE and non-fetal MI, non-fetal stroke, and cardiovascular death. And they all demonstrated clinical benefit in their respective cardiovascular outcomes trials. So thinking about how these agents work, exenatide, loreglutide, lixazinatide, semaglutide, and dileglutide all work at the GLP-1 receptor. And then now we have terzepatide, which acts on both the GIP and GLP-1 receptors. Yes, it certainly is nice to have these in the toolbox. We need all the help we can get to help people reach their goals. So can you tell us more about the two incretins and their physiologic action in the body, GIP and GLP-1 receptors? Sure. So in persons without type 2 diabetes, the majority of insulin release after a meal is mediated by incretins. And these incretins are GIP and GLP-1. However, the effect of these incretins are impaired or slightly reduced in people with type 2 diabetes. So therefore, we want to supplement back GLP-1 and GIP in people with type 2 diabetes. So in humans, GLP-1 receptor agonism is thought to increase insulin when the blood glucose is high. It's also known to decrease food intake by slowing down gastric emptying 
And it also decreases glucagon when the blood glucose is high as well. And then for the GLP-1 receptor agonists that have cardiovascular risk reduction indications, there's some thought that not all the benefit is attributed to the blood glucose lowering alone. And some evidence suggests that there may be direct effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists on the cardiovascular system. So unlike for GLP-1 receptor activation, there isn't a medication on the market that only targets the GIP receptor. So the actions of GIP receptor antagonism can only be inferred by experimental approaches using experimental compounds. With that being said, glucose-dependent insulotropic peptide, or GIP, exerts the following actions, some of which have been demonstrated in preclinical trials, and some have not been confirmed yet in humans, but this is what's been postulated. So GIP increases insulin when blood glucose is high. It also potentially increases glucagon when blood glucose is low. So it may prevent people with diabetes or just people in general from going hypoglycemic. And contrary to GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are believed to induce nausea, GIP might have an anti-adverse action and might mitigate some of that nausea. GIP also may decrease food intake in some preclinical models, it's been shown. And it also may improve insulin sensitivity and improve proper storage of triglycerides and use in adipose tissue as opposed to liver and other organs. Christy, thanks so much for that overview of the physiologic action. There's a lot to that. Uh, I want to move on to talk about guidelines now. And the ADA and EASD just released their updated consensus report on the management of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes. So could you help us see where these therapies fit into that treatment algorithm that they released? So thinking about the guidelines, we're all familiar with the ADA standards of care and the new EASD ADA consensus report still is very similar on the left side of the algorithm and that those with clinical ASCVD or those with indicators of high risk, we still want to select a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular disease benefit. So specifically semaglutide, dilaglutide, and liraglutide. So we could select one of those agents still on the left side of the algorithm And then for those with heart failure and CKD, SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred. However, we should still be selecting a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular disease benefit if the SGLT2 inhibitor is not tolerated or if it's contraindicated or if the A1C is still above target and people with diabetes need additional cardiovascular risk reduction. What's new is the right side of the algorithm where now there's a larger focus on glycemic management as well as meeting and then maintaining weight management goals. And this is really where we're starting to see more preference towards the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So when we're thinking about glycemic management, the algorithm really now focuses us or encourages us to think about including metformin, of course, but then an agent such as the GLP-1 receptor agonist with efficacy to achieve and maintain treatment goals. And of course, we want to avoid agents that might uh, lead a person with diabetes to more often have hypoglycemia. So in general, the algorithm now recommends higher efficacy approaches so that the person with diabetes is more likely to achieve their glycemic goals. So now they start to strategize based on very high and high efficacy and intermediate agents. So very high efficacy agents are dilaglutide at high dose, semaglutide, and terzepatide. So now preference is given to those three agents as very high efficacy agents to help people with diabetes meet their glycemic management goals. And in thinking about weight management goals as well, it's still recommending general lifestyle advice. And in thinking about encouraging our people with diabetes to enter into a weight management program, but then it considers encouraging people with diabetes to choose glucose lowering therapies that have very to very high glucose and weight efficacy properties. And now they stratify it based on very high, high, intermediate, and neutral. So for efficacy for weight loss, very high efficacy for weight loss now is preferenced as semaglutide and terzepatide, and then high efficacy for weight loss being dilaglutide and liraglutide. So now what we're seeing is GLP-1 receptor agonist and the new GIP GLP-1 receptor agonist being preferentiated as high efficacy for weight loss as well as high efficacy for glycemic management. So really starting to give preference towards picking more efficacious agents as well as thinking about helping people with type 2 diabetes meet their weight management goals. And we know that GLP-1 receptor agonists and GIP GLP-1 receptor agonists can really help our patients or help people with type 2 diabetes 
meet their goals. Thank you, Christy. So we know that many people with type 2 diabetes are on more than one medication for their diabetes. So what is your recommendation for concomitant medication use when starting a GLP-1 and GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonist? Yeah, so for people with type 2 diabetes, now the guidelines really do recommend that we start people on a GLP-1 or GIP-GLP receptor agonist even before insulin to help them meet their glycemic management goals. However, if a person with diabetes comes into our practice and they're already on maybe insulin or a DPP-4 inhibitor or sulfonylurea, one of the things that we do is we start them on a GLP-1 or GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonist and then we'll want to go ahead and start to taper off potentially the insulin or the sulfonylurea. We usually leave on metformin, the SGLT2 inhibitor, if that's already on board. However, our goal is to reduce the hypoglycemic potential and reduce concomitant insulin use and really try to derive full benefit and get up to target or maximum dose of the GLP-1 or GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonist. So what we'll do is usually we first start by de-escalating insulin therapy. So for people that were starting on a GLP-1 or GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonist, I might decrease the bolus insulin um, by 20% or even the basal insulin by 20%. If they're on a sulfonylurea, let's say glipizide 10 twice a day, I'll cut the dose in half when starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist or a GLP-1 receptor agonist, really trying to remove those hypo agents that have hypoglycemia potential that really don't have any proven cardiovascular benefit and try to optimize these agents to help with glycemic management and weight loss. So I would definitely recommend de-escalating and removing insulin therapy as you're adding these agents on if possible. We've actually found that we've been able to take off bolus insulin when we've started these agents because they do help curb appetite. They reduce and slow down gastric emptying and people with diabetes are eating less. They don't require as much insulin. And we've been able to remove mealtime insulin therapy for people with type 2 diabetes, just adding on these agents and titrating up to maximum tolerated dose. If a person with type 2 diabetes is already on a DPP-4 inhibitor, we know that these agents aren't synergistic and it's really a very similar mechanism of action except the GLP-1 or the GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonist has a much higher efficacy. So to prevent the person with diabetes pain for two brand name copays, we usually just stop the DPP-4 inhibitor upon starting one of these agents, just due to the overlapping mechanism of action and considerations for polypharmacy. Those are all really important points you make, Christy. And I know that anytime we go to start a new medication, We need to be able to review the side effects for the therapy. And so can you let our audience know what the most common side effects for these therapies are? Sure. I think the most common that we see in clinical practice are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And among those that do experience these, they're usually mild to moderate in severity. And they typically occur when the person with diabetes first starts the medication. However, we do notice that they go away over time. So across the GLP-1 and GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonists, the number of people that experience nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea varies, meaning some people may experience these side effects and some people may not. Another thing that we've noticed is that some people may have side effects to one medication in the class, and then we'll switch them over to another medication, and they may tolerate it very well. So it's very patient-specific and really just depends on the patient and how well the agent agrees with their system. Right. So it comes down to individualization again. So Christy, our audience is probably interested in what your experiences have been with initiating these agents and how you help mitigate the side effects and encourage persistence with the medications. So usually when we counsel people with diabetes about starting a GLP-1 or GIP-GLP-1 receptor agonist, the first thing we want to counsel them on is to get ready to eat less because we know that these agents slow down stomach emptying and they help them feel more full. So it's important to counsel people with diabetes to eat smaller size meals, to eat more slowly, and really to stop eating at the first sign of fullness. That's really going to help mitigate some of this nausea and then potentially vomiting if that develops. Another important counseling point is that the person with diabetes may start to notice that they feel a little bit more nauseous, but usually that's going to be mild and resolved within the first couple of weeks if they're eating slowly and stopping at the first sign of fullness. If they continue to have issues, it's good to recommend low-fat foods. 
It's also good to start at the lowest dose of this agent of the GLP, GIP, or GLP-1 receptor agonist and titrate slowly based on the prescribing information. And if the side effects do develop, just have them mentioned to their physician or provider, and they could possibly decrease the dose back to the highest tolerated dose. So overall, I think the most important counseling point is really preparing the person with diabetes that they have to be ready to eat smaller, more frequent meals, and then just stop eating at the first sign of fullness. And that should really help hopefully prevent some of the nausea that they might experience with these agents. So now we know what some of the side effects are and how to mitigate them, but what is the actual prevalence of the side effects? Sure. So nausea usually occurs in about one in five or 20% of people with diabetes, vomiting 13%, and in diarrhea, maybe about 17%. Now, these are not all the possible side effects that patients may complain about. They may also complain of decreased appetite, abdominal pain from these agents, among others. All right. At what point do the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea become a safety concern? All right. So we have to be careful with these agents and those with gastroparesis or other GI issues. In addition, we want to monitor for adverse GI reactions that may cause volume depletion in those with acute or chronic kidney disease. So it's important to keep an eye out for that. Also keeping in mind that exenatide IR and ER, as well as lixazenatide, have dosing cutoffs in kidney disease. So just be aware that those three do have kidney dosing adjustments. If the side effects become bothersome or don't go away, definitely counsel the person with diabetes to reach out to their provider because sometimes therapies need to be discontinued and another agent may be more appropriate. Well, Christy, you've given us a lot of great information, a nice overview of using these agents. Do you have any other considerations you want to leave our listeners with? Yeah, so in general, these are very efficacious agents. We don't use as much insulin in our practice anymore now that we have these available. And we've seen much better glycemic management as well as weight management since we've started incorporating these regularly into our clinical practice. In addition, we know from the cardiovascular outcomes trials that loreglutide, semaglutide, and dileglutide have additional cardiovascular disease benefit. So overall, we're getting cardiovascular risk reduction, weight management, we're seeing less insulin use, and really, they're just overall great for our patients. We've had a lot of success with people with weight loss, just feeling better about themselves, really kind of motivating them to start taking better care of themselves, start exercising more, eating better. So with proper counseling, we can see really great results with these agents. It's so nice to see an agent with great efficacy and such a low risk of hypoglycemia when used on its own. Overall, these are definitely preferentiated in our clinical practice. Christy, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this episode of The Huddle and for sharing your knowledge and experience with our audience. For me, as a diabetes care and education specialist, I know how useful this information is for practice, so I'm sure our listeners really appreciate hearing your firsthand experience. Thank you, Jody. It was great to be here today. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Huddle. To access the notes and resources from today's episode, head over to diabeteseducator.org forward slash podcast. And remember, ADCES membership gets you free access to resources, education, and networking that improve your practice and optimize outcomes for your clients. Learn more about what ADCES can do for you at diabeteseducator.org forward slash join. This episode was sponsored by Lilly, a global leader in diabetes care since 1923. The information presented here is for informational purposes only and may not be appropriate or applicable for your individual circumstances. This podcast does not provide medical or professional advice and is not a substitute for consultation with a healthcare professional. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.